Hi, I'm Greg Salmeri for the Salem Center. <laughs> <laughs> Our topic tonight is the internet as a platform for ideas. And it's an interesting day to be having a talk on that as I think the world's richest man uh, has just announced a hostile takeover bid for Twitter, aiming to make it a free speech platform. Um, Elon's a local, so we're hoping he'll turn up, but I don't see him yet. Uh, maybe he'll be watching online. Uh, we have a really ideal person to be taking us through this issue, especially in a day when there are so many hot takes on it, and almost all of them are facile and uninteresting. That is, on what it would mean to have free speech on the internet, uh, what social media is and could be as a platform. Uh, we have speaking with us tonight, Brian Amridge, presently the CEO of Thoughtful, a new uh, company that I'll tell us a bit about uh, in the course of the remarks. Former, uh, formerly a senior design engineer at Facebook for many years and who came to national attention, some of you might remember back in 2018, uh, due to an internal memo that got leaked, not by him, about um, Facebook being a monoculture and what could be done about to get more diversity of ideas there. Um, I think thoughtful is an appropriate name for the company. Um, I'm sure because of the company's actual goals, but if Brian's uh, so thoughtful a person with respect to what the internet is, what the various platforms on it already could be, and what kind of thought is required to think about uh, how to make something great out of it. So I'm really happy to have speaking with us tonight, Brian Amridge. All right. So. Sort of a little bit of history here. Um, you know, in, in late 2011, when I was thinking about joining Facebook, uh, the most compelling reason I had to join was because of this 30,000 foot view that I had about technology. Uh, and it was basically that if you look at the history of technology, I mean everything from the crane press to the radio, the TV, to the internet. Um, email. The, the thing that the most impactful technology has in common is that it accelerates the velocity with which one human being can get an idea out of their head and in front of another person. And that matters. It matters because it mattered to me because I believe in the power of ideas. That ideas drive history, that the fundamental philosophical ideas of a culture determine its trajectory and that especially individually the ideas that you have for yourself about what your life is what you can make of it um, matter and then along comes facebook in my head at the time and it represents this discontinuity in that velocity it, it, it represents this ability this free technology with which suddenly people with no power money a connection to the media can suddenly say i exist here are my ideas and if they got it right if they got their ideas framed in the right way if they were persuasive that could change the world you know, billions of people were on the path to having that ability I mean, that was so exciting to me uh, so that's why i joined facebook almost 10 years ago and, you know fast forward today you know, billions of people are indeed connected to the internet. Um, you know, theoretically, the internet has the potential to facilitate access to the best that the world has to offer in terms of information, ideas, and people. Our time on the internet should be a consistently, mind-bendingly enriching experience. It should make our time off of the internet unrecognizable. It should make our time off of the internet far more rewarding than it otherwise would be because we should be wiser, we should be connected to more interesting people, and we should be regularly learning about new ways to live our lives and spend the precious time that we have. That's the potential. Um, but tragically, the internet today, I think, has overall made many people's lives less enriching, more distracting more stressed, more anxious, less connected to the stuff that matters most, less engaged with what they can do with their lives, what they can make of 
of their own lives. Why does this happen? How do we fix it? Those are huge, huge questions. Um, but that's that's what I'm going to try to talk about the essentials of today. So first, why is this happening? The obvious reason, um, the one that you probably think this talk is about, uh, is because of overbearing content moderation policies. Uh, you know, Elon Musk, as, as Greg mentioned, tried to buy Twitter this morning for $43 billion because apparently he thinks that that's the big issue. Um, and to say I'm sympathetic of that view is an understatement. Um, if you aren't allowed to say certain things, particularly things that don't break the law, but merely offend people, or go against the consensus, you're not allowed to say that stuff. Uh, what any platform is ultimately doing Intellectually is promoting dog. Truth is discovered by individuals through argument and reputation, often at great cost. And the history of ideas, of religion, of science is very clear about that. You speak the truth often at your own peril. So the willingness to be offended is the ante, the small ante, that we all pay in order to pursue the truth. So yes, content policy is important. You're not gonna hear me argue against that. But I'm gonna say something that no one else says. And apparently Elon needs to hear about this issue. Bad content policies are not even in the top five reasons that these platforms are failing as platforms for others. Not even in the top five. Because you see, if you zoom out, the most important thing to understand about the internet platform landscape today is that it's not a failure if you consider what these platforms were designed for. For the most part, non-social platforms like Wikipedia and Google are extraordinarily useful for uncontroversial facts. Life-changing for uncontroversial facts. Facebook is amazing at helping you stay connected to your friends and your family and your community. Twitter is almost disturbingly good at keeping you in touch with what's happening right now. And YouTube, Instagram, podcast apps, you know, they broadly exist to entertain us. And they do. They're really good at it. So what exactly is the problem? The, the problem is there is a major category of content that is very important to people. And that these platforms handle very poorly. That, that category is ideas that are complex, controversial, and crucial to our lives. And I think of those as the three C's. Complex, controversial, and crucial. You're going to hear me talk a lot about those. Uh, and that's the kind of content that's like, what kind of school should I send my kid to? What kind of diet is healthy? Are NFTs a Ponzi scheme? Uh, what should our government do about Russia or China? You know, this, these are the kind of issues that smart people disagree. You know, they're issues for which there's no single obvious answer. There's no single obvious perspective that can be easily applied to our own lives. And for that kind of content, the internet today is a disaster. And while good content policy is necessary, it's not sufficient. It's not the fundamental cause of the disaster. The fundamental cause is that each of the major platforms is systematically designed in a way that is terrible for complex and controversial ideas. They weren't designed to handle this kind of stuff. So I want to take you through a little bit of why that is and then talk about how to fix it. So by its nature, Wikipedia, an encyclopedia, it attempts to give you a single perspective on an issue. And because of its democratic nature, it ends up skewed toward mainstream consensus, regardless of whether that is or is not true. That's sort of you know, an inevitable attribute of the nature of a single point of view that you get in an encyclopedia. And Google, Google search is very similar. You know, they have something called the page rank algorithm, which essentially decides which search results show up first. And that you know, page rank doesn't even attempt to capture what's true. Its, it's, it's aim is to promote the content that is most authoritatively and consistently linked to. And that's extraordinarily useful for uncontroversial ideas. But it's 
little more than a confirmation of what the consensus view is on more complex and more controversial issues. And on the other hand, Facebook and Twitter, they're more optimized to show what's engaging and will, will capture your attention, which again, when it comes to intellectual ideas, that's barely more than what's popular or scary. And you know, popularity, I really, I don't think I have to explain to this audience, but popularity is a disastrous methodology for ranking content that is complex or controversial. And it also means, with ranking by popularity, that absent an overbearing and overspecified content policy, clickbait and sensationalism will rise to the top. You know, see also parlor, Gab, fortunately, we've run this experiment before. And you take the way the Facebook and Twitter work, you just delete their content policies. What you get is junk that rises to the top. We've run this experiment. And so none of these platforms where we spend 99% of our time fare very well when we're trying to use them to discover the entire category of content that I regard as the most important content a human being can ever encounter. That's a big deal. Uh, but they're all we have today. And so we try. You know, I'm sure some of you have, have tried to give feedback to Facebook and Twitter to no avail. Some of you have probably left social media altogether. I can't blame you. And now Elon Musk is trying to buy Twitter. <laughs> so what else can we do? How do we fix this? And so to fix this, I think there are three things that we need to do that I'm going to dive decently deep into. The first is that the market has to be free, which you know, I'll say a, a bit more about that, but it's obnoxious that I even have to talk about that. <laughs> Second, people need to broadly recognize that the problem with today's social media platforms, as far as ideas go, is much deeper than bad content policies. Like I said, not even the top five. And third, as a result, you know, I think we need to start from scratch. And what that means is rethinking every aspect of how a social platform works from the perspective of what helps people find, discover, understand, apply complex, controversial ideas. So first, uh, leave companies free. Uh, you know, this is, it's obviously critical. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's a little disappointing. This is controversial today, uh, particularly among the political right. Um, so I want to try to bust a few myths about, about this. Um, as somebody who's extremely well acquainted with how these companies deal with competitors internally uh, and what it's like to compete with them both from the inside and now from the outside. Uh, so many people try to argue that it's impossible to compete with the major platforms because of what they call network events uh, or that they're monopolies that abuse their power. This is absolutely nonsense. Uh, the only reason that these platforms have such a huge influence is that no one else has solved the problems better than they have yet. When I look at this market, I can see that when companies do a better job, they win. This is why, broadly speaking, if you want to understand the social media landscape, over time, what's been happening is it's been splintering. You have these super centralized networks like Facebook, and over time, they are splintering into smaller, more niche networks. And the reason is the small and more niche networks do a better job at what they're trying to do. It's why Instagram became a huge thing. At this point, it's better at friend content than Facebook. It's winning because it's better. Nextdoor is now taking over local neighborhood content because it's better. You know, and for better or worse, TikTok is taking over the stupid 15 second videos that rot your brain because apparently they're better. Uh, <laughs> And so, by, by the way, you know, this whole argument that you can't compete with Facebook, they're just too entrenched. Does anybody know when TikTok was released? Any guesses? Two years ago? Pretty close to that. Um, you know, it's basically 2017, late 2016. They have over a billion users today. They are an upstart. They're new. They have a billion users today. The idea that you can't compete with Facebook and Twitter is nonsense. Uh, history doesn't show this. It's, it's just absolutely untrue. When someone does better, they win. And ironically, regulation is the thing that threatens to change that. You know, the repeal of Section 230 immunity would stop my company dead in its tracks because I can't afford to pay lawyers 
every single time we make a decision about content. I'm never going to be able to afford that. <laughs> you know, other proposed regulations I've seen, you know, they set up these standards, but you know, they basically take the community standards that something like Facebook has made and they they essentially formalize that, you know, from a legislative point of view. They talk about how you must and must not moderate content. And in doing so, they are going to annihilate the ability of any small company to compete. You know, I, I know from, I mean, deep, this is public knowledge at this point, it takes Facebook a team of 15,000 people to enforce their asinine policy. <laughs> uh, you know, upstarts my, like my company, we, are, we can't and won't ever do that. You know, we're not hiring 15,000 people to do this. It is a total non-starter. And so you know, as a CEO, of one of these competitive companies, I'm telling you, my company's biggest existential threat is not Facebook. It is power-lusting government bureaucrats that want to tell Facebook and me how to operate. That is my biggest threat. I am not worried about Facebook. And lastly, on the government issue, you know, a lot of people talk about this like it's a free speech issue. And you can feel free to ask more about this in the, in the question period. But the short version is like, that is not a serious argument. Uh, these platforms are not public squares. Every public square that existed 15 years ago is still there. What these platforms are, are private squares that just happen to be lots, lots better than the public squares we used to have, that we still have. And that, does, But that doesn't make them public property. You know, the fact that you really want something, the fact that you know it's really compelling, that we get lots of value out of it, doesn't make something public property. You know, the platform for ideas that I think a lot of people dream about is only going to be possible if we remain principled about this issue. And that means not making up excuses and contortions to violate the First Amendment. You know, we, we can't rationalize our way into having the internet actually work as a means of exchanging ideas. So great, you know, let's assume, you know, these companies, Facebook, my company, competitors to its both remain free from interference. Now what? Now, now I think we need to develop really broad recognition of the fact that the problems with today's platforms are way deeper than content policies. And this is going to be news to many people. You know, this is the issue of content policy, this is perhaps a surprise from those of you who know me. Uh, it's overemphasized. People pay too much attention to it. Uh, and I don't blame them. You know, it took me seven years at Facebook. And like Greg said, like the New York Times story about the war I was waging internally for me to figure that out. This is not the top issue. And in the aftermath, I'll, I'll tell you why, what, what, how this evolved for me. In the aftermath of the you know, uproar that I caused, you know, I had a conversation with a certain C-suite executive at Facebook. And they told me point blank, we are never going to give up our hate speech policy. There is nothing you're going to do, there's no argument you're going to make that's going to make us change our minds about this. And it was exactly at that moment in my head that I, I resigned. That was it. And I, I left the room and I thought, okay, now what? Because I was there to build a platform for ideas. And if that wasn't going to be possible at Facebook, I started to think, okay, well, where else am I going to do it? What other platforms are? Are other platforms a better fit for this? And so I started to think really carefully about how well aligned or not aligned existing platforms work you know, with the purpose of helping people find complex, controversial ideas to make sense of them. And it turns out when you actually spend some time thinking about it, when you stop you know, the preoccupation with how are we going to make Facebook good at this, if you actually think about what it would take to build a platform for ideas that was really good at this hard category of complex, controversial content. It turns out that the existing platforms we have today are really poorly aligned with it, like really poorly aligned, regardless of their content policy. And so we've already talked about the fact that you know, something like Facebook and Twitter, they rank content by engagement, they essentially promote what's popular, um, and they, you know, they don't have any sort of ability to rank by thoughtfulness, if that, if that is such a thing. Uh, but you know, I want to drive this home. A single system, a single news feed that has to comparatively judge a wedding photo and a foreign policy is a bad idea. <laughs> that is not going to work well. 
Yeah. At the end of the day, if you have to decide which of those goes above the other, you're going to have a problem. These things are not like each other. The ways that you evaluate them, you, you can't do it. And so when you actually, and that's only the beginning, because when you actually start thinking a little bit more carefully about what follows after that, it only gets more absurd. These platforms have a huge emphasis on recency, you know, which again, it makes sense for wedding photos. It makes sense when you go on Twitter and you're you know, looking at riot in San Francisco. Um, but it makes no sense when you're trying to figure out whether global warming is really a catastrophe for human beings. Recency is not the thing you want to organize ideas by in that case. Most of the best content on any complex issue was not produced this week. Recency is just the wrong way to measure this. Or how about the fact that this is, this is a huge one. How about the fact that these, these platforms employ the exact same commenting system for a photo of your lunch than they do about an article talking about whether COVID lockdowns are justified? It is the exact same system as if the needs of that discussion were identical. It's absurd. The entire, in fact, the entire emphasis on social discussion is absurd. You know, the best way to learn about a complex issue is it's not going to be by reading your uncle's thoughts on it. And it's certainly not going to be by reading a random stranger's thoughts on it from the internet. By and large, the reality of how we develop knowledge is that we do it privately. We do it individually. We do it by exposure to the best arguments for competing perspectives. And then we have to do the work. Now, I'm not saying that discussion has no place. It certainly does. But a productive version of that discussion is unrecognizable from what we're doing on Facebook. It is unrecognizable from what we're doing on Twitter. Where most, the model is basically we invite random people onto a stage to performatively yell at each other. I mean, that, that is essentially what commenting systems on the internet are today. It is miles from what you would design if you were actually trying to make this a healthy thing. And I could stop there. And I think I would have made my point about them being a bad match for complex controversial ideas. And I'm not done yet. I really want to drive home how crappy these platforms are <laughs> for, for ideas. You know, beyond ranking content by engagement, Beyond their emphasis on recency, beyond their insane commenting systems, they're also optimized for short form content. They are designed to give you quick dopamine hits in quick succession, in rapid succession. And that trend is getting worse with all of the platform going whole hog on you know tick on copying TikTok's 15 second assaults on your dignity. So short and short form content is great, you know, when you're trying to turn your brain off. Uh, it has its place, but is it enriching? Is it thoughtful? Does it actually make you think more clearly? I mean, obviously, no. A true platform for ideas optimizes for long form content, and it helps you fit that content into your life, which can be difficult. Sometimes people need help with that. And last but not least, and this is, this is a big one, you know, consider the epistemological views that are baked into the products today, baked into the platforms by virtue of being built by engineers and designers in Silicon Valley. And you can, I mean, I lived there for over a decade. You can summarize everything Silicon Valley thinks about ideas, learning, about epistemology in a single platitude, which is follow the experts, capital E experts. Who are the experts? They don't really know. Who chooses them? They don't really know. What happens when they disagree? They don't really know. Is it even possible to objectively determine the truth for yourself? They don't really know. They don't have answers to any of those questions. And the truth, because such a thing does in fact exist, uh, is people develop knowledge through work. It is work. It is difficult work to do. Their own work by grappling 
with competing perspectives, by weighing evidence, by sizing up expert input, by testing ideas and seeing how generalizations comport with reality. It's work. And the people who build today's platforms, they don't believe in your ability to do that. They think you need to be told what to think. And that whether something is true is mostly determined by whether or not it's said by a person with a PhD or an MD after that. That's not thinking. That's following. And no content policy is going to fix the fact that most of the people in Silicon Valley cannot tell the difference. So I hope, I hope I've made it clear, like, there's nothing you're going to do to these platforms to make them fulfill the promise of a platform for ideas that we all, we all dream about the internet being. Every aspect of how these platforms work needs to be rethought to encourage and incentivize thoughtfulness. And before you get too excited about that, <laughs> I want to give you some more sobering perspective. This is, this is a really important piece of this. I'm giving away some, some competitive advice. The single biggest reason I saw competition to Facebook fail is that they didn't think about scale correctly. And usually when somebody says this in Silicon Valley, they're talking about how you handle 100 million users without having your systems fall over. Not what I'm, that's a hard problem. It's not what I'm talking about. The hardest part about building a new social platform is that it doesn't just have to work for 100 million people. It has to work for 10. It's easy to design a platform that would be wonderful if the whole world was using it. That's not that hard to do. The hard part here, what's really hard, is to make something profoundly useful to 10 people, and to do that in a way such that when more people join and it grows and you eventually have 1,000, 100,000, a million, 10 million, 100 million people, you do it in a way where the value add that people are getting parlays into a flourishing network. It parlays into a flourishing platform for ideas. So they have to be, you know, the product is gonna evolve over time but it's eventually got to add up to that big picture. But you can't start with 100 million people, you start with 10. That is the name of the game we're talking about. That is the art of arts. Nobody's figured this out. So with that in mind, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Thoughtful. I co-founded Thoughtful with my friend, Alex Epstein, uh, who is a philosopher and one of the clearest thinkers I know about, guess what? complex, controversial ideas. Uh, and Thoughtful's mission is to build what we call the enriching internet. There's a lot of work that we need to do to get there. But it starts small. Our work begins with how we use our phones. If we're all addicted to 15 second TikTok videos, we are screwed. We've already lost, game over. There is an epidemic today of technology-induced ADHD. People know this, they can feel it. It's why there's this movement to detox from your phone. You've probably heard about that. It's why even Apple, who makes the phone, is demonizing screen time by building tools to help you spend less time staring at your phone. But I think these efforts are misguided. They've chosen the wrong enemy. Our phones are not the enemy. The way we use them is the enemy. The habits we've allowed ourselves to build. The fact that we can't stand in front of an elevator for 30 seconds without being distracted, that is the enemy. And our answer is Thoughtful, which is a new social media app designed exclusively for the kind of content we're talking about. It is the only platform I am aware of that has been designed in every aspect from the ground up for exactly the kind of content that sucks everyone else, for enriching content thoughtful content for complex and controversial ideas. And like I said earlier, when you design from the ground up for this kind of content, literally everything about the app ends up different. And just give you, give you a sense of this. On Thoughtful, there are no posts. There are no likes. There is no comment system. What's left? <laughs> it's that different, right? And so I'll, I'll, I'll go through each of those a little bit. So like I said, we have no posts. 
the atomic unit of content on Thoughtful is a recommendation. This on its own is huge. It's a huge deal. The atomic unit of content is a positive appraisal of something good. And so what unites all of the content in Thoughtful as a result of that is that it's not just engaging. It's actually worthwhile. It's very difficult to criticize something just for the sake of saying something is bad on Thoughtful. Content doesn't make it there. The stuff that makes it there is the stuff that's worth your time. The videos, podcasts, articles, books, it all lives in Thoughtful. All the different content types. You can subscribe to things like YouTube channels or podcasts or different blogs, all in one place. So you aren't siloing out your books into Kindle and your podcasts into the podcast app. And some, you know, maybe some of the good videos in the YouTube app. There are lots of problems that happen when you silo things that way. What we're trying to do is create a place where just like you know, you might go to Facebook to waste 15 minutes because you've got some time and you want to be distracted. We want to replace that habit with, can we make that time into something useful? Can we make it add up to something? So part of how we do that is we put all of the amazing, we unite all the content by the fact that it is worthwhile. Whether you've got five minutes or an hour, whether you want to read, or watch, or listen, there's one place to go. You don't have to think about it. There's one place to go, and every single time you're going to get something that is worth your time, something that you're proud of having consumed and spent time on. And most of this content is long form. On average, the, the average length of content in Buffalo is 20 minutes. And to help manage your attention, you have a feature, a really powerful feature called Q. And Q is a lot more than a saved list. In Q, when something is in there, your place is always saved. Video, podcast, even if it's an article, the exact word you are on when you are done consuming it is safe. You will always pick back up where you left off. It's just part of how you make it accessible to break up long form content into these smaller sessions. It's super easy to pick up, pick back up where you left off. And it's also self managing. So you know, it'll prompt you to try things that you might have forgotten that you had. It. It'll prompt you to continue or pick back up where you left off on something that you might have forgotten about a little bit ago. And again, the result is that it doesn't make a difference what context you're in. If you have a little bit of time, you have a bunch of time, you want to listen, watch something, read something, any of the context that you might have that habit of pulling out your phone and going to Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, you can fill that time with something that's actually great, it's actually good for you, it actually makes a difference in your life. And so part of building that habit is that we track what we call thoughtful. And that's how much time that you actually spend, not scrolling in the app, we don't care about that. It's how much time you actually spend in this amazing content. And we help you turn that into a habit. Because again, this is, this is the screen time you're proud of. That's why we put it front and center in the app. Like I said, we don't have likes. Likes are gone. We have something called thoughtful time creators, which is how much thoughtful time your recommendations create for other people. And the funny thing is, I didn't see this coming at all when we started building this. When you have a community of people that show up for thoughtful content, where it's not competing with, you know, a photo of a dog or a burrito or, you know, <laughs> who knows, a car crash, but it's not competing for that kind of content, it is amazing how much thoughtful time you can create, even in a small community. You know, I have a much larger following on Facebook and Twitter than I do in Thoughtful, just because of the size of the platforms. But I actually get more engagement. I have more thoughtful time created in Thoughtful than I do on any of the other platforms. It's just crazy. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It means so much more when you share something and you see, oh, you know, this actually created two hours of thoughtful time for you know five or six people. That is so much more meaningful than I got five likes. So like I said, we don't have comments either. At least not the kind you're used to. Next week, we're actually about to introduce a new kind of commenting, which re-examines all of the incentives involved with discussion on the internet. And it's going to help people do Q&A, share thanks. Every piece of content. It's a really big deal because part of how you learn is by, by looking at alternate perspectives. What are the best arguments for the competing point of view? We're beginning to facilitate that with this new kind of commenting system. And lastly, like I said, lastly, content vaults. I haven't talked about that. Uh, 
Our policy is that as long as it follows U.S. law, your judgment is what matters. That's it. We facilitate individual curation to the extreme. Every automated system we have is trained on nothing other than your judgment. There is no magic AI here. There is no editorial voice. It is only you deciding for yourself. So like I said, this is day one. You know, for me, it's pretty exciting day one, uh, but it's still very early compared to where we want to go. You know, today, we think of what we're doing is building a thoughtful community, building a movement of people who care deeply about ideas, understand their importance in their life, and want to spend more, con more time on content that actually matters to them. And if that's you, if everything that I've talked about you know, sounds exciting to you, it's actually available today. You can go download the app, it's thoughtful.community slash Brian. That's my referral link. Uh, and hopefully in the future, I'll be able to talk about where we go from here. But for now, if you only want to take, you only get five things out of what I'm saying here. Here they are. Number one, today's platforms are actually really great at what they're designed for. But they are terrible at complex, controversial ideas. They're terrible at the kind of content that I think knowledge seekers care the most about. And it's, that's for many reasons, not just their Orwellian content policies. Number three, this is a solvable problem, but we have to treat it with the respect it deserves. We cannot oversimplify it by vilifying Facebook and Twitter, trying to buy Twitter and change the content policy. That's not going to work. Regulation is not going to fix this. Number four, we have to rethink everything about how these platforms work, starting with the habits we have when we pull out our phones. Because if we can't solve that, we are screwed. That's the non-starter. Related to that, if you're excited about Thoughtful, please go give it a try. Uh, Thoughtful.community slash Brian. And number five, lastly, and I think most important, we cannot give up on the promise of the internet for ideas. I have been working on this issue in one form or another for a full decade as of, I think, two weeks from now. And I have absolutely never been more excited about what's just around the corner and what still remains possible. Thank you very much. It's not done at all by the system. You know, everything that we do is based on your individual judgment. And so you know, in Thoughtful, when you have a, the network itself is only for the purpose of, of finding and spending time on Thoughtful content. And so the people that you follow on Thoughtful are not going to be friends, not going to be your family. They're going to be, be people whose judgment you respect. And so that's the primary input, is who you follow, and then outward from there, who they follow. You kind of build your own network of people whose judgment that you share. That's the biggest input. If there's more to say about that over time, but that's really where it is today. I guess related to that is it, I argue with you in that it's only giving you recommendations based on a certain group of people that you follow. How would you get recommendations outside of that for what you said, the other competing yeah. sides? Did you mention that a little bit in the comments? Yeah, so this is actually really interesting because we spent a bunch of time on this at Facebook. You know, this idea of that, you know, are we promoting echo chambers? Like what actually happens in an echo chamber? And I think it's a total misunderstanding of this issue. Like the right way to figure out what you think on an issue is not to, you know, follow people who you actually agree with and then frustrate yourself by following a bunch of people that you disagree with. Like most of the time when that actually happens in practice, you just ignore the people that you disagree with. <laughs> That's not very helpful. The right way to think of this is that on every piece of content, if you're serious about figuring out what's true, we want to show you what the best alternative perspective is. So it's not about who you follow, it's about on a, on a per content basis, can we show you the best alternative perspective? And that's you know, part of what we've been building toward is the ability to do that. And what we're about to launch next week is the first step. Could you talk a little more about the you said you want to be free from, you have to be immune from more based on the current war. Um, 
want to get into whether you're a publisher or, or just a platform for exchanging ideas, would you comment a little more on that? Yeah, I mean, th this notion that there is a dichotomy between you know being a platform or being a publisher is, is actually a really interesting one. I think there, there are really two fundamental misunderstandings here. Uh, first is just conceptually, you know, I think it's a false dichotomy. I don't think that you know what we think of as platforms today are you know in, in, they are both publishers in, in certain ways, and the fact that they do exercise editorial control to a certain extent, but they're also much more neutral parties in the sense of being you know a neutral platform in the sense that most of what they do you know, is not editorialized. Most of what they do doesn't exert any control over user generated content. And so. You know, in, conceptually, I think that's a false dichotomy. I think that they are actually both in various ways. Now, legally, it's actually even a little bit more interesting. So a lot of the time when people are talking about this, they're referring to, to Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act when they're talking about the immunity that's granted to platforms. Well, there are a couple of misconceptions about this. Number one is that the word platform actually doesn't occur even once in Section 230. Now, what they, and there's a reason that people who make this argument uh, try to try to sort of trick you into thinking that, that the word occurs. The word that occurs uh, in Section 230 is an interactive computer service, which is essentially a website. Right. So it's like there's no special category called the platform. There's just a, there's just websites, there are computer programs, things like that. There's no special. So the, the, there's no the distinction of you know, part of the reason this is important is that this question of are you a platform or not. Like that's that's a little bit more complicated than are you a website. Are you a computer program? That's actually very straightforward. The, the, the category of companies whose products fall under, under their interactive computer service is extremely broad, and it ought to be. You know, the second piece of this is like, you know, this question of this question of like you know, trying to pigeonhole people into being a, a publisher. Again, if you look at Section 230, what it's doing is actually eliminating the distinction. It's not actually bringing, bring, introducing a distinction of you know, platform versus publisher. It's actually eliminating the distinction and essentially saying, in order to make it possible for these services to exist, we are not going to hold you responsible for user-generated content. And the conditions that, that they accept you know, for, for granting that immunity are extremely broad and they're extremely clear. So, you know, I think a lot of the legal issue is it's nothing more than rationalization. You know, I think if you look, if you go read Section 230, which I encourage people to do, it's extremely short, it's extremely straightforward, um, and it's not nearly as, as controversial or conditional as I think a lot of the modern debate makes it out to be. What are your thoughts on some of the long-term effects of platform for or I mean, I think there's steps in the right direction. In the fact, in, in the sense that they are they are long form, and long form matters more for complex, controversial issues. Uh, you know, I think depending on which one you're talking about, to the extent that they they exert editorial control, it becomes problematic because it just becomes more about other people thinking, less about you exercising your own judgment, um, which is not particularly helpful. Again, when it comes to controversial issues. You have to do the work yourself. And so having any kind of editorial control is very problematic. Um, you know, when it comes to things like Quora and Reddit, you know, in some ways they, they are a step. You know, Reddit in particular, I think, is a step in the right direction in the sense that they they have community standards that are set by the community, which you know, anytime you make it more localized, it becomes a little bit less overspecified and actually a little bit more relevant to the to the kind of content you're talking about. But fundamentally, they still suffer from the same terrible methodology, which is that they're focused on popularity, you know, they're focused on up, vote, down, vote. Um, and that is, you know, it leads this, to this kind of group think and consensus that you know, Reddit is at this point so so famous for the kind of hive mind mentality, uh, which is it's just it's just not at all what you need when you're trying to figure out what you think on an issue that uh, there are competing good arguments for different perspectives. So. Yeah. Just call out on it. Would you do something to sort of go against people's um, just tendency to go towards like recency or things like coming out that's um, interesting and it's like super provoking a short attack on access? I think it's human tendency to do. Is 
Does your platform do something to counteract them? Uh, I mean, I think the question is really incentives in the first place. The, 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 the point to solve that problem is to remove the incentive to share in the first place. And so, you know, part of part of how you do that is, you know, like like I said, we don't have there's no there's no there's no, there's no system for liking. There's no there's no sort of short form evaluation of content that we share with people. There's nothing to gain in that sense. Um, you know, the, the, the metric that you people end up optimizing for on something like that is how much time people actually spend. Which if you actually look at, you know, I know this from some of my time on Facebook, if you look at the, you know, the, the most clickbaity kind of content on Facebook, uh, you know, it, it's, it's clickbaity in the sense that it gets people to click it. They don't spend very much time on it because it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that you know, this is nonsense. It's just, you know, they, they got my attention with the headline and then, you know, that they pretty quickly uh, change what they were saying. And so you know, a lot of it is about incentives. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so do you think it's actually a, a good sign that um, the long form content like podcasts um, has actually risen in popularity and you know, yes. certain someone who happens to live here has a very popular podcast <laughs> that regularly has like three plus hour episodes. Yeah. People, millions of people listen to. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a wonderful size. Um, you know, I think, I think the task for platforms today is to figure out how to drive more distribution to that kind of content, how to how to deal with it in a way that helps people consume it in a way that's convenient in their day to day life. Um, you know, that's I think the biggest the biggest reason that that kind of content isn't you know 10x what it is today is just because you know, the, the commitment it takes to actually listen to something that's three hours. Is big, and you've got to have time for that. And it's actually a lot of work, absent something like Thoughtful today, to break that up into smaller sessions and know to come back to it and remember to come back to it. I mean, it's just, we've got to make that easier. So the emphasis of long form content is a wonderful thing, and uh, the platforms need to support it if they want to actually do better at this stuff. Yeah, so I know on Facebook optimizes for time spent. That tends to optimize for kind of consumptive video watching. It was because it takes longer for someone to get back into the state of the week to find the next thing and they're less likely to share. So yeah. I'm sure you'll have a take on like why that won't fall, like why that won't happen on your platform. But I guess I'm curious if you would have thought through, I mean, it sounds like you have a Reddit example. Like, what are the other larger platforms out there that are closest to promoting thoughtful content? Like, I, I would almost argue that like, Amazon product reviews, like, people can disagree and it's still, like, you get helpful stuff. Um, I'm just curious if you've thought through what the, like, more scale platforms have in terms of promoting real thoughtful content, and if you could contrast your optimization for time spent versus like, that. Too. Yeah, I mean, honestly, there's, there's not a lot. There's not a lot. Uh, Good role models uh, in this respect. I mean, the, the short answer to your question about optimizing for time spent is uh, is actually is going to perhaps surprise you, uh, perhaps surprise a lot of people in Silicon Valley. It's just that uh, we don't have a data driven culture. Uh, that's not what we're doing at all. You know, we are not making decisions and shipping. We don't A/B test, which is <laughs> shocking. Um, you know, we are not making decisions on the basis of how to even optimize what I'm saying is the metric that I, you know, if you made me choose a metric, it would be how much thoughtful time um, you know, people are spending. But uh, we don't evolve the product and ship changes to the product on the basis of how that number moves. You know, we, this is part of why, you know, I've, I've funded this entirely myself so far in order to be able to take the time to do all of these things methodically uh, without just throwing a whole bunch of stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks, which is often the culture you get if you are trying to optimize for you know, a single metric or even if you have a counter metric. A lot of what you do to build a thoughtful company is actually as different as, you know, as different from most you know, Silicon Valley startups as the way the product works compared to the rest of the social platforms. Um, you're incredibly, I, I'd say we're more like Apple in the sense of thinking really, really deeply about what we're doing, why it should work, 
versus trying a bunch of things and seeing what makes you know line go up. So that's a big piece of it. Uh, the you know, the other piece of it though is just you know we're, we're very very careful about what Facebook calls unconnected content. We used to call it unconnected content. We're very very careful about the kind of things that Thoughtful puts in front of you that you haven't expressed positive judgment on, the sources you haven't expressed positive judgment on before. Uh, and part of that is because those things can be gamed, that the inputs to that, um, your training systems are usually, you have to give it a metric to figure out what exactly, you know, what is the basis of the recommendation going to be. Um, part of why we're so careful is that, is that there is a danger in that. So, I think we're going to grow more slowly because of that kind of thing. Um, but it's the right call to make in order to respect individual preferences, in order to actually ensure that we're not blindly optimizing for anything. And that's it's a short version. There's more technical pieces about it. Maybe we'll do that later. Um, how are you handling people ranting out into new areas that you say a month and a half ago? I did that I was with in international relations and Eastern Europe. <laughs> and that was you know, to dive into that, but I don't know who to follow, I don't know yeah. what to look into. Uh, what's the what process for getting that graph of those people that I find problem started? Yeah. yeah. So so this is one of those those challenges that changes based on your scale. And so you know, I mentioned that the hard part about building a social platform is it's got to be valuable for 10 people and it's got to be valuable for 100 million people and you can't start with 100 million people. And so part of the consequence of that is that you can't solve every problem at once. And so you know, one way that that manifests in the product today is that one thing you can't do with Thoughtful is go in and search for, you know, give me the best article about what's going on in Russia and Ukraine. You keep that kind of whole system where you are asking for content about X. That's something that you can really only do at scale. It's something you can only do really well at scale. And so we're not trying to do that. That's part of why we have this emphasis, and I think on the more fundamental starting issue of how do you help build people, how do you help build help people build a habit of spending time on more enriching content. And part of how you do that is with more of a push model. It's more of a, you know, these people are generally interested in the kinds of thing I'm in, the kinds of things I'm interested in. Uh, these sources I know, I usually enjoy their, their stuff and I actually get something out of it, I learn something from it. And when you put all that together, it creates something magical because you know, you, just like Facebook, you don't know what you're gonna get when you open it, but you know it's gonna be good. That's very different than the kind of Google model of I wanna learn about X. And so, you know, I think the answer, my answer to that will change over time. When you, when you get enough scale, you start to be, doing, be able to do interesting things uh, in terms of helping people find, you know, the best content on X. And in some ways, that's kind of the holy grail of this problem. If you can solve that well, if you can help people find the most thoughtful content on what kind of schools or SM they get to, I mean, that's the you know, that's the trillion dollar opportunity, if you will. Um, but you can't start there. And we're not starting there. So, so. Not just about crazy because it's not just about the problem, it's about the problem of you know, the community about the other and customer. When you were talking about Twitter and Facebook, there's a you were talking about the recency sort of the recency bias. And on the other hand, if you look at Wikipedia, there's a kind of you know, it's not really kind of the changes have been made recently, but there's a the stories aren't coming up for you to look at based on what's going on uh, right now. I think that part of what I value about knowing thoughtful people, knowing intelligent people, um, is not just that I can go to them with a question or find out what their best thought was in the past, you know, over their life, um, but that I'm kind of like living in time in the world with them. And like, you know, something happened in Ukraine and I get to hear yeah. the, the, the people who I respect saw them. So how will be thoughtful and then how in general do you think of this um, the, the the situation the experience in time 
and yeah. relative to what's happening to you now, but without it being, um, you know, 30 second attention snatching, um, sure. like the distracted hamster. Um, yeah. Now. yeah, I mean, I think that the, the short answer is that you, you have to do both really well. Um, and that, you know, you, in, in general, we design for an emphasis on the stuff that's great, the stuff that, that is sort of the all time greats, but that's not, you know, there are, there are going to be moments when that's not appropriate. And you've got to be able to handle that as a use case. And so, you know, if you just, I can't show you thoughtful right now, but if you just look at like where, where how screen, you know, screen real estate is allocated in the app, um, you know, the queue, which is the stuff that you, you're sort of in progress on, it'll occupy about 60% of the screen, but not so much that you, know, you can't see the new stuff, the stuff that's coming in A from B. And so, you, know, you have to accommodate both. You know, we have a not everything that you share on Foxhole is what we, we call top recommendation, which itself is this really unique category that's very hard to capture everywhere else, uh, which is you know, the all time greats that shape the person's perspective. You know, it's really cool to be able to have that in Foxhole, but even most of the stuff that people are recommending in Foxhole isn't at that level of, oh, this is a top recommendation, this is perspective altering. We let you share recommendations that are not top recommendations as well, which, which you know tends to be a little bit more timely than other ways, but it tends to capture more of that time than time. time. So I think you know, the challenge there is just capturing enough of both, making it possible for you to again, you know, we, we have to trust our users. We have to help help build better habits, but also know that you know it's not always the right time for you to be you know reading reading a book that's going to change your life. There are moments where you're not going to want that. If you want to build a place where people rely on go, when you know it's always going to be appropriate, you have to accommodate those things. Hopefully, it's not junk. Hopefully, it's not the you know 15 second videos that rock your brain. But you know, there is something in between. We try to go on. So you said uh, anything within U.S. law is permitted. Mm -hmm. um, now I know for a lot of like video hosting websites that have said like we're free speech website, they quickly become saturated with like the worst elements of society. Yeah. I mean like conspiracy content, hateful stuff that's not allowed on the, the other websites and apps. So um, are you concerned about the image it'll create and as well as driving away the types of people that you're trying to attract? Yeah, so there's, there's two really important pieces to this. Um, part of the reason that content policy is not the place to start solving this problem is that if what you do is essentially clone Twitter or Facebook and then you just delete the content policy, you do end up with that dumpster fire. I mean, you end up with something that the only people who are going to be interested in it because the product is otherwise the same are the people who can't be or don't want to be on the, on the big platforms. You end up with the regions in a certain sense. Uh, and that is not the community you want to start with. If you're trying to build a platform you know, that is actually conducive to, to, to being thoughtful and finding a rich income on the internet, that is not the audience you want to start with. And so, I think if Elon Musk succeeds in buying Twitter and gets rid of the content policy, we will very, very quickly see that this experiment will not turn out very differently than 4chan for Gap, for that matter, which is pretty much like what we're talking about. So that's that's number that's number one here. Number two is that again, coming back to this challenge of you, know, you can't start with 100 million people. You can't necessarily start with you know the vertical stack of technical infrastructure that will let you be completely independent. So what I mean by that is like, you know, these platforms are hosted on things. They have hosting providers, they have you know, ways of storing all of the content. And if you're if you're making money, which hopefully you are, you're charging money, you're processing credit cards, all of those services along the way have their own content policies. And when you're building one of these platforms, you are beholden. You know, that's a contract. You're either gonna follow it or they're gonna kick you off, right? Which is what Parler saw um, you know, in the last in the last year or so. Uh, and so this is part of the problem you have to deal with, is that you can't live in fantasy land and say, you know, oh, we're going to allow everything, but then host the content on something like Amazon Web Services, which has a policy that says you can't host it. You know, that, that's just, it's just foolish. It's not very serious. And so this is, again, part of, why, part of why we have this emphasis on starting with the habit formation is we don't actually host content today. Everything that you see in Thoughtful is actually hosted somewhere else. Uh, and that's like a, it, it, you know, that's not how it's going to be forever. Um, but part of what we do is we, we are an aggregator. 
we aggregate from everything. We aggregate from YouTube, we aggregate from the podcast services, we aggregate from you know, just any, any link you want to put in there, any website you want to put in there. Um, and so that's part of how we get around that today, is that we're not actually solving that problem today. And we can't. You know, the only way you end up solving was the way Gab has tried to solve it. And you know, we see how that works and doesn't work, which is mostly it doesn't work. So eventually, you know, we're going to get there. And we've already sort of begun the work underneath as we scale uh, in order to be able to move to more independent infrastructure. But you know, if, you, if you're really serious about this being a scalable business, you can't play the, the card that Parler tried to play, you know, play you know, crying, crying when uh, you know, people actually enforce their contracts. And so it takes time and a lot of money to do that. And you've got to have a strategy that, that gets you there. Um, do you ever think that the internet has actually become too thoughtful and people, um, what people actually create, like you hear people complain that you can't go on any social media platform without seeing like politics and everyone's always debating all these things. like so serious and like, yeah. it's just, even with, like media and entertainment and people, what people really want it's just like just... Yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of pieces to this too. I mean, for one, most of politics is actually not. You know, in my view, I think we are way overexposed to that kind of content. And I think, in practical terms, when I think when I think about thoughtful content, I'm talking about stuff that matters to my life. And I think the reality of political content is that it's important to be informed on sort of a macro scale and where things are going. Uh, it's important to to know enough in order to be able to vote. Um, but that's not daily. That's not weekly. It's actually probably rarely even monthly. Um, I think most of how people consume political news is essentially like the way they consume ESPN. I mean, it's entertainment. Um, it's entertainment because people are fighting with each other. And so you know, that certainly doesn't fall under the, you know, everybody is, can use their own kind of definition of what they think is thoughtful, what they think is worth their time. But part of what we're trying to do with the thoughtful and part of what my experience as a user of this thing has been, has been that I've actually been exposed to lots of content that I never knew I cared about. You know, different kinds of fiction even that have taught me, uh, you know, parts of myself, taught me, helped me learn about parts of myself I didn't even know were there. Uh, that's the kind of content that I think ends up being unique when you get this right. Uh, I don't think it becomes overexposure to news. And I don't, you know, very little of what I've seen in the history of thoughtful has actually been you know, day to day news. Maybe some analysis, but even that is subject to you know, the kinds of people who are sharing that and make the choices about whether or not you think it's really thoughtful. Um, yeah, I think that's the high level meaningful to your life sort of and that could be big and they're big and small versions of them. Doesn't have to be all heavy and serious. Yeah, um I just heard you say a lot of perspective that I think is very different than I've heard Silicon Valley engineers talk about. Um how they would approach problems in their businesses, which um like when you answer the question about how do you stop conspiracy, those type? I think an engineer would mostly approach it as a black box and have to consume content or do something. And you saw it more as a perspective of like, how do you grow a community, the ideas behind it. Then you also talk about how when you're, you don't have like one uh, data point or a few data points that you're trying to optimize. And I think if you told that to like a Silicon Valley engineer, their mind would explode, they wouldn't be able to grasp it. So I guess my question is, what is, do you have some basic approach? Is this just a, such a new way of approaching this that um, I'm curious if you like some basic theory that you're relying on as you're developing this? Or, I'm just very curious about yeah. that. And then, I mean, fundamentally it comes down to you know, again, this perspective that's baked into everything we do, which is also baked into how we're building both the product and the company, is that um, thinking works. <laughs> that, that's a, you know, that sounds really stupid, but like, you know, when you are really careful 
methodologically about how you approach a problem and you're really honest intellectually with what you know and what you don't know and how confident you are in your conclusion, if you're really methodical about that, uh, you can get pretty damn close to 100% confident that you're right about X, Y, or Z. Um, or you'll know exactly how, how likely it is uh, you, you are to be right. And so, you know, part of it is just that, you know, Alex and I trust our ability to think carefully and deeply about these issues. Um, and we don't, we don't unnecessarily seek validation um, where it's not needed. You know, the way we use data is, is not to figure out what to do or what's wrong. Um, you know, we'll use it to confirm a question, something like, I mean, it has to be a really highly specified question. Uh, but, you know, I think that there's even a bigger picture here, which is that, I mean, you have to be really focused and clear on what you're trying to do. Um, and you know, that means you have to have a purpose, to have a mission, and to be absolutely maniacally obsessed with bringing every decision you make back to that. Um, not doing it for the wrong reasons, always deferring to the mission, always doing and being clear on what exactly is the relationship between this tiny decision I'm making and what the purpose of this platform is. You know, if you do the work, people do the work of thinking that at that level, bringing every small detail up to the big level, up to the big picture, making sure that they make sense and that they're integrated. Um, you know, that's how we work. And it's ironic in a certain sense uh, because you actually move much faster when you do that. And on one hand, it takes so much time and it's exhausting. You know, Alex and I spent I think, almost four months just you know talking and working on this. You know, how, how do we actually? How do we actually? What, what is it like to discuss some things in a productive way on the internet? Like, how do you do that? How do you actually, you know, tease it apart? So it takes time to do that without throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. But the reality is. When you are that careful, you don't enter it. You just shit. You just build it. And you know, you, you know, nothing is perfect. Sometimes you're gonna get stuff wrong, but you would be surprised. My colleagues, my former colleagues at Facebook would be shocked at what portion of the stuff that we build works exactly the way we want it to. And it's not because we're magical. It's not like we're not omniscient. It's just you do the work. You just you, you, you think really, really carefully about what, what what the dynamics are and what you're trying to do. And then you trust yourself. I'm really excited about this. Um, <laughs> the feature about having your spot saved and everything is, that seems like a great way to um, actually make my five minutes here and there useful. Um, I, I want to say to succeed, and I, I do think that there are a lot of people who want this who are really hungry for it. Uh, but you were saying that you, you were expecting to grow slowly. And I'm wondering, what are your, like, what are your ideas for growing the community? How, how do you expect this to happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the fundamental way we think about it is that you know, this is not some market that exists that we're tapping into. I think if we were trying to do that, we would go the, you know, we really focus a ton on free speech, and we, you know, we'd say like, oh, we have the, you know, the platform where you can say whatever you want, and, and um, you know, essentially what I think Elon Musk wants to do with Twitter. Um, we're not doing that. You know, what we're, we want to solve this problem in the long term, and that means that we've got to start with the fundamentals, not just in terms of what we're capable of doing as a business, but in terms of, you know, on an individual user basis, like the problems we're trying to solve in people's lives, free speech is not a problem in our lives. There's a reason it matters. It could amount to something that is a problem in your life. But there is a real, like the, the purpose of that, when you're talking about the internet, is so you can be connected to the ideas that actually matter in your life. 
so that you can be informed on the issues that actually matter in your life. So you can make decisions. There is a purpose to it. And so when you start with that, rather than you know, sort of consequential, you know, the, the secondary consequence of you know, what is this content policy, what is allowed, what is allowed, you don't sort of trend, get transfixed by that. You focus on the fundamentals. What are we actually trying to make possible in people's lives? What's supposed to be different in a person's life as a result of using this product? When you focus on that stuff, um, you know, I think we have an actual path to solving this problem the real way when we focus on that. But that's a much, I say we're going to grow more slowly because that's a, that's a mindset. It's a mindset to say, like, it's a problem that I can't spend 30 seconds in front of an elevator without pulling out TikTok. That's, that's not something that's you know, it's obvious to some people. It's not obvious to other people. Um, and so part of what we, we have to do is build this movement of people who recognize that there's a problem with the way that we're spending time on our phones. And well, that, that takes time. It, it seems to me that so many people already see that there's a problem. Yeah, I mean, I think the but question is. There's nothing is, to use yet. Like yeah. you said, there's no yeah, yeah. market yet, or there's nobody's having that market yet. It's so I, I, yeah. I mean, I think it, it's all about what you're, you know, part of the, for better and worse, like, I cut my teeth on many things at Facebook where what it means for there to be a big market is we're talking about billions of people. Uh, so when I say it's not a big market, I don't mean that it's not, you know, even a million, 10 million people. I think it is. Uh, I don't think we'll have any problem turning this into a great business, matter, even at the scale we're talking about, the scope we're talking about. Um, the question is really, like, the internet is a very good place. Yeah, you know, it's a very, very good place. It's very hard to imagine how big and how many people are actually on the internet. Uh, and I spend, you know, so much time at Facebook trying to think at that scale. Nobody ever gets used to it. Uh, and so, ultimately, I do think the problems that we're solving, you know, the ultimate some problem we're solving is, is, is again that problem of how do you find the best ideas on complex controversial issues that is a multi-billion person problem every human being who has access to the internet is going to want that if it exists so to me right right exactly and so to me like that's the ultimate that's the full full market um, you know, there's a path to get there it's very long uh, and the market that exists today is a very small fraction of that, but yes, it's, it's still millions, for sure. What hope do you have for Facebook, for all those companies, um, seeing your example and eventually transforming in that way? I mean, you know, I, I think I kind of hinted at this in a way, but like, I think they need to, to stick to what they're great at. You know, I think that they need to think really hard about why they do the work that they do and what their purpose is. You know, they're staying connected to your, you know, talk about Facebook for a second. Like staying connected to your family and friends and the communities and events that you care about, that is a massively important thing. I mean, it, it, is, it does such profound things to your life when you, if you do or don't have that kind of service. And Facebook is so good at it, it's, it's like nothing else. I mean, that, that's part of the reason that people are still there. They're not there because of the political junk. I mean, they're, they're there because the, the core product is actually really good. That's why they came in the first place. So, I mean, my hope for them is that they rediscover who they are and why they love what they do and why they built it in the first place. And they get back to being great at that. Because, like, you know, and I can, I can say this. Like, I, I was obsessed with Facebook's mission when I was there. I loved it. You know, I, I saw where we could go with that product, even separate from the platform for ideas stuff. And it was just the beginning of like, what is it, what is it, what happens when the world and the internet actually becomes social? There's so many interesting things you can do there if you're not distracted by you know gaming time spent by getting people to watch you know, BuzzFeed videos. It's, I hope they get back to that. And you know, there's a there's a version of that answer for every one of these platforms. You know, I think. You know, Twitter is, is in a state where, again, like, the thing that Twitter is amazing at, the reason that people came here in the first place, is they are just disturbingly good at helping you understand what's happening right now. And that's an interesting question. There's a reason to have that kind of service. But they've got to, you know, I think that they have to rediscover who they are. 
You know, they, they shouldn't be trying to become, you know, the platform for ideas. It's just an abuse of, of the model. That's not how the product was designed in the first place. And I think I think that they'd be very well served uh, doubling down on what makes them great rather than sucking by like, trying to do all these other things. I think that, again, same answer for YouTube, same answer for Instagram. All of these services have reasons that they're great. Uh, they have real problems that they solve in people's lives. So I guess related to that, I mean, I can go on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and curate a list of thoughtful people I follow, but is your argument that the nature of those platforms makes that more difficult to do for thoughtful content or you're focusing on? I mean, it's, it's a couple of things. One is that when it's intermixed with everything else, you have a real problem because the kind of when it's intermixed with something like you know, the junk that is very you know it's kind of like sugar right it's like it's like a sugary cereal like it tastes really good when you're eating it but it's actually not that good for you if you just put that stuff on the table at the same time with the, with the really great content the stuff that's actually worth your time to steak if you will right like if you'll only have like five you know 30 seconds let's say like you're gonna go for the zero you're not gonna go for the steak and so part of it is you just when you mix things these these things together you don't want to put people in a position of constantly having to exert willpower in order to do what's good. Uh, that's that number one. But number two, and you know, this is what I, I, I sort of tried to really put, drive this home. It's like it's just a total abuse of what these platforms were built for, right? It's like the, it's not. This isn't so much a problem as it is an opportunity in the sense of like the internet could be so much more powerful as a tool for us to find and understand and grapple with the big issues in life. It has so much potential in that regard. And you lose all of it when you try to deal with wedding photos at the same time. I mean, that, that's the short version. It's like when you exclusively focus on that kind of content, it changes everything about how you approach building one of these products. And so, you know, today you might think like, oh, you know, these are all, all kind of similar. I get like portions of this in this or that service. But you know, I think in the long term, when we actually build out some of these these tools, there's there's not even it's not even close. The, the kind of progress you can make personally when you are regularly encounter, encountering enriching content is going to be it's going to be night and day. I'm just curious, what's your business structure? <laughs> yes, yeah. you LLC, something else. Or I mean, we're a corporation. We're a privately funded corporation. Um, we have not taken any outside investment to date. Uh, you know, the short version. There's a whole bunch. I think I could say about this. It's kind of interesting. But um, you know, I spent a little bit of time at Apple before I was at Facebook. Um, and Apple is a very different company than Facebook. I sort of learned a little bit about what these different business models do to the companies and how they think about who their users are, who their customers are, and they make decisions about what to ship and not ship. And one of the things that I've observed play out over time, which I was very curious about when I first joined Facebook, you know, coming from Apple, um, was what does it do when your users are never put in a position of having to decide how much Facebook is worth to them? That's what advertising actually ends up being. Becomes because it's free to everybody, which has all sorts of great benefits. One really interesting downside of that is that you never actually have to decide this is worth it to me, this is good. And it makes it really easy for people to stop thinking about what the value they're getting from a service is. This is in part, I think, it's a big part of why Facebook has such a shitty brand today, is that nobody has to think about. What good is it? What good am I getting from the service? You never have to actually never put in a position of having to decide that. And so people don't think about it. I think, you know, in part, people actually get a ton of value from something like Facebook. But nobody is really thinking about it because you're never you're never putting your money on one. And you contrast that with something like Apple. They charge for literally every single thing they do, right? Like they charge for a polish in the ball <laughs> to clean their to clean their devices. Uh, and they charge a lot of money. You know, they're, they're a luxury, they're a premium brand. And 
the psychology of what that does uh, is fascinating. You know, when you decide to buy an Apple product, it actually becomes almost part of your identity. You know, people love Apple in part because they are making a value judgment in choosing them over the alternatives. And part of that is the price that they pay. There's a pride that people, people feel about having chosen and caring enough to buy the Apple product over, say, the, the product from Google. Uh, and so, now that's been very interesting to me over the years to sort of watch how that's played out. And you know, the way I think about it in terms of business model is uh, we're going to make something that's really valuable for people and they're going to pay us. That's it. You know, <laughs> that's really it. Uh, we're not going to do advertising. Um, we're probably going to be a subscription service. And that's going to be, again, part of the thinking in that is we do not want the distraction of having customers who don't value what we're doing. We want, I mean, we want to be really focused on this mission. And part of that means we're going to pursue the simplest possible business model, which is if you like what we're doing, you decide that it's worth, it's worth something to you, you're going to pass. So you know, that'll, that'll do what it does to our bottom line. But I think we'll be fine. Um, so you're, you're thinking about your customer and you want to make sure that we get the people who are value what you're doing. And I'm wondering if there are any customers that you would seek out um, and give them an exemption to that board. Like if, you, if there are people who are consistently recommending really wonderful content, like they're just, yeah. they think through things really deeply. And it, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's a whole world of like, the simple version of that is that you, know, you like what we do, we pay you. Uh, there's a lot of nuance and, and I think interesting complexity you could add to that kind of model uh, where you know, people who are you know, creating lots and lots of awful time on the platform either you know, becomes free for them or some portion of their, their subscription becomes paid for. There's all sorts of things you can do with that. It's very, it would be very interesting to get to the point where we're for them. So I'm wondering, as you're choosing these people, um, does that kind of become a, a way of almost monitoring content? Well, we don't choose anything. Right. Uh, well, I mean, part. if you're offering something for free that you usually charge for. I'm sorry, I don't sorry. understand the question. <laughs> it's a little, I don't know. Um, so if you have users that are paying you, and then you have users that you offer the service for Because they're giving oh, sure. your product. Yeah. Um, by, by offering that free ride for those people, yeah. um, does that, does that kind of become like a, like this person brings in this type of content and therefore this type of content becomes your brand? I mean, I think that's, that's part of the risk in a certain sense. Um, you know, part of how we built Thoughtful is that, you know, like I said, there's no unconnected content that you get in the app. So everything that you see is, like, there is a very obvious reason why you're seeing it. So it's really very, if somebody is sharing something that's, uh, you know, that you really, really don't like, if you're seeing it, it's because, he, you know, you've essentially asked to see it in some way. So there's very little of it that you can sort of point at us and say like, oh, well, you want to put that in front of us. It's just not how it works. You know, to, 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 to sort of steal me, so, like, yeah, I mean, if we were to do something like have discounted rates on subscriptions for particular users for particular behaviors, that is a kind of editorial control, right? That is us, you know, choosing one user over another. And, you know, I don't, when it comes to distribution of content, I don't think we would ever do that because um, you know, for all the reasons I've mentioned. Uh, when it comes to pretty much everything else, I don't think I would shy away from that, though. I mean, there are always going to be accusations that we have an opinion, and we do. Right? It's like we, we have a perspective on what it means to spend time thoughtfully on your phone. And right. everything we're doing is about building that. And you know, we're being very uh, epistemologically careful about not putting our perspective onto, onto how everything, you know, not putting our perspective onto how content moves around the platform and what gets promoted and not promoted. But 
we do have a very strong view on methodologically what it means to be thoughtful. And we're, you know, we're very, we're very upfront about that. Like we think the truth exists. We think that part of being, you know, thoughtful and intellectually honest is looking at counter arguments uh, and seeking them out. Uh, and so we don't shy away from that. We have an opinion. And if you like it, you can pay us. If not, you can, <laughs> there's the door. So many questions. So many questions. Uh, is there is there one in the back behind the chair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't really see how any of these platforms even could pay lip service to that, but I don't think it's any that certain kinds of thoughtful um, um, areas of the game that it would be valuable to bring in experts to look at that. And that's not deciding things at the level of uh, content per se, but it is deciding who counts as a worthwhile expert. Sure. And, and to be honest, I feel like one has to do that to reach the best that is going to I mean, I think the question is who's doing it. Right? Like, I don't think that there's any doubt that experts, I mean, just to be clear, I have nothing against experts, whether they're real experts or not. I mean, whole experts have their place, and their place is in providing input, but ultimately, the perspective that we bring to this is that you are making the decision about how you rate that expert input. You are making the decision about how much you trust that expert. You are making the decision to examine or not examine the claims. You are making the decision to look at who their biggest, uh, you know, what the biggest counter arguments are against what they're saying, who their biggest opponents are in the election. You, at the end of the day, have to make that decision yourself. And the position we take is that companies should not be the ones, really, nobody except you should be the one designating someone as an expert, putting them in front of you, promoting their content in place of someone else. That kind of editorial decision making. That kind of, I mean, ultimately it comes down to, you know, it comes down to epistemological um, babying. I don't think is appropriate. I don't think that that helps people figure out what's true. Uh, can you have to, as a company or as an individual, have to make the same kind of determination? For myself, but not in the product. And that's the whole art of art series. That you, you, when you break it down to the foundation and you rebuild such that you are deferring to the actual process people follow to figure out what's true, there will be no company deciding who the expert is. That is not that is not conducive to actually figuring out what's true. I think if you look at what the alternatives to that have been in Silicon Valley. The last two years are a phenomenal example of this. The amount of privileging that certain experts have had uh, on the, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and the degree to which uh, that has helped and hurt us over the last two years. It's very clear that the companies, they're not in a position to be doing any better on this than we are ourselves. Well, I mean, wouldn't the, wouldn't the consumers still have to be in any judgment between the different companies in their sense of the are. I'm not saying that they're forced to do anything. I'm just saying it hasn't helped. Okay, I mean, I, I just guess I think that you really want the most thoughtful thing. You need to kind of encourage and, and, and monetize and incentivize experts to, to be provided. Let me ask a follow-up. I think the one the appropriate thing. What is the approach? If I'm going to get brought out in that, I'm, I'm getting that. You're going to find people to follow through people you already follow. And so you, in using the app, get a list of people that you regard as interesting, thoughtful, et cetera. They bring over the app people that they regard that way and so forth. And so the idea is like through that kind of community network of that, You'll, um, people will appear in your feed thought by the people you think wise uh, to be knowledgeable about COVID or Ukraine or whatever, when you plan to come to a network of that. So 
We yeah. do have a network of large companies. There's a, a method of discovering experts, but it's through um, chains that I respect this guy who respects that guy, yeah. rather than, um, so using the social network to create that, the story of experts, rather than the companies at a program level. That's exactly right. And, and if you, you know, for those of you who sign up for Thoughtful, if you look at, we have this you know, feature called Explore, which is essentially what, it's a feature that is designed to help you explore exactly that web of, you know, this person thinks this person is thoughtful, and they think this person is thoughtful. And we, we facilitate pulling content from a couple orders out uh, from the people that you think are thoughtful, which ended up being an like extraordinarily useful mechanism. So you just, you discover so much that way. And it happens to, you know, as a result of the fact that you respect someone's judgment, what it means to respect their judgment is in part that you're probably pretty well aligned with what what that person thinks is thoughtful, and who that person thinks is thoughtful. So it actually becomes a really effective way of looking at you know, how similar your judgment is to someone else. How and the content that you pull as a result of that ends up being extraordinarily high quality. And it's not universally true. Um, it's, it's sometimes people follow someone that you, know, you won't share judgment with but it is a lot lot better than just trusting you know, whatever decision making or epistemological process that you know, my former colleagues in Silicon Valley use themselves to, to, to decide who knows what the truth is a lot better. Okay so let's have that for the last word. Thanks everyone for coming everyone on Zoom. Uh, for joining us in that meeting. And anyone on YouTube watching later. And thank you for